2014, Facebook scientists published the results of one of the biggest psychological experiments ever conducted. They took almost 700,000 Facebook profiles and deliberately skewed their news feeds to be either more positive or more negative. Then they used the company's sophisticated algorithms to measure any shift in people's mood. Their findings? The more positive the feed, the happier Facebook users seemed to be. The more negative, the more depressed they became. It proved the power of Facebook to affect what we think and how we feel. Facebook has very cleverly figured out how to wrap itself around our lives. It's the family photo album. It's your messaging to your friends. Um, it's your daily diary. It's your contact list. It's all of these things wrapped around your life. This is the story of how one of the world's biggest and most powerful private corporations is turning our lives and our data into vast profits and in ways we have no control over. They are um, the most successful company, arguably, in, in human history at just gathering people's time and turning that time into money. Like his company, Facebook's founder hardly needs introducing. Mark Zuckerberg started the social media platform 13 years ago when he was just 19 as a site for Harvard undergraduate students. When we first launched, we were hoping for, you know, maybe 400, 500 people. Harvard didn't have a Facebook, so that's the gap that we were trying to fill. And now we're at 100,000 people, so who knows where we're going next. Within its first month, more than half the students had joined, setting the trend for the membership explosion that followed. Now, almost a quarter of the world's population has signed on. It is bigger than any country. Facebook is now a global colossus. It is one of the world's most valuable corporations worth over $400 billion. Mark Zuckerberg is an international power broker in his own right. He's like a king, right? He's like a monarch. He's making decisions about your life on Facebook, what the rules are, and he's a benevolent dictator. You can't say that this is accountable governance or participatory governance um, in, in any particular way. But almost two billion users still isn't enough for Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg is aiming for the next billion. There is a limit to how much they can grow in established markets like North America and Australia, but the 32-year-old businessman sees huge potential in the developing world. There are a billion people in India who do not have access to the internet yet. And if what you care about is connecting everyone in the world, then you can't do that if there are so many people who don't even have access to basic connectivity. There's a term that's being used uh, by folks uh, connected to Facebook and Google called the last billion, where they're basically trying to figure out a way to spread internet access, but the internet that they're gonna spread is an internet that's shaped by Facebook and Facebook's agendas. That's actually part of the long game here. Most people in, in a lot of the developing world are accessing the internet through their mobile phones and they're, are these programs that are known as zero rating or Facebook zero, um, so that when when you when you get your smartphone, you can use uh, you get free data if you're using Facebook, and so people stay on Facebook. They don't go anywhere else, um, and so so that's their whole world on the internet becomes very much you know, the same as 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 you know they, they don't know any other kind of internet. Facebook is a free service, but that's because Zuckerberg has learned how to turn our data into dollars. Lots of dollars. Last year, his company earned 27 and a half billion US, just under $16 for each user, and he's buying even more internet real estate. Clearly, there's one topic that we have to start with. You bought WhatsApp for $19 billion. Why did you do it and what does it mean? 
you can look at other messaging apps that are out there, you know, whether it's Kakao or Line or WeChat, that already are monetizing at a level of 2 to $3 per person with pretty early efforts. And I think that that shows that if, if we can do a pretty good job of helping um, WhatsApp to grow, that this is just going to be a huge business. Facebook has WhatsApp, Facebook has mm -hmm. Instagram, mm -hmm. Facebook has um, Oculus Rift, not necessarily mainstream, but these are yeah. very big corners of the internet. Mm -hmm. Should we be concerned? We be, be concerned about the monopoly? We should always be concerned about monopoly. We should always be concerned about concentration of power. We should always be concerned about that. And we need to hold their feet to the fire at all times. We figure Facebook is all about community, right? It's all about what people around the world are coming together to do, connecting with friends and family, and forming these communities. Facebook presents itself as a digital platform, a neutral stage upon which life plays out. 2016, we all went through it together. It says it's a company that develops digital technology, not social engineering. For all the talk about community, Facebook is neither democratic nor transparent. Everything hits closer to home. Any place we go to that is not truly open, that's not governed by us as users, that's not governed by sort of some democratic accountability, is actually a place that is, is, is not truly ours. It's a place that we can use. It provides great value in many ways, don't, don't get me wrong, to its users, but it's incorrect to see it as a neutral place. It can do things like a government, and indeed it has sort of inherited uh, some government-like functions. But I don't think that passes the smell test to imagine that, that uh, Facebook or any online platform is truly democratic. They're, they're not. If we tell the computer to look at two numbers and compare them and put the larger number on one side and the smaller number on the other, then, with a series of steps, we'll be able to reorder it. So to understand how Facebook works, we need to understand what goes on under the hood. The engine that drives the system is built on algorithms, sets of instructions that Facebook's engineers use to determine what we see in our newsfeed. Dr. Sulet Dreyfus, an information systems expert, demonstrates how a basic algorithm works. Typically, an algorithm uh, might be for processing some data or um, uh, doing some arithmetic, um, summing something, for example. Uh, or it might be to try and recreate the decision-making process that we use in our human brain on a more sophisticated level. Facebook's algorithms were originally configured to help Harvard University students stay in touch with one another. They exploited the way the students had a small group of close friends and a wider, looser social circle. The algorithms are now vastly more complex, but exactly how they work is a closely guarded commercial secret. We do know that they're designed with one aim in mind, to keep us online for as long as possible. The algorithms are designed to uh, be helpful and give us information that's relevant to us. But don't for a minute assume that the algorithms are just there to help us. The algorithms are there to make a profit for Facebook. And that is Facebook's genius. It is a giant agency that uses its platform to deliver us advertising. By tracking what we do, who we associate with, what websites we look at, Facebook is able to make sophisticated judgments about the stories we see, but also advertising that's likely to move us to spend. We'll probably always live in a world with old-fashioned display ads. Times Square simply wouldn't be the same without it. But these ads nudge us towards products with all of the subtlety of a punch in the nose. Facebook, on the other hand, uses the extraordinary amounts of data that it gathers on each and every one of us to help advertisers reach us with a precision that we've never known before. And it gives anybody in the business of persuasion power that is unprecedented. Depending on what we post at any given moment, Facebook can figure out what we are doing and thinking and exploit that. Now, Facebook's very well aware of 
you know, our sentiment, our mood as we talk to people, and it can put all that data together and start to understand like who our exes are and who our friends are and who our old friends are and who our new friends are, and that's how it um, it really works to incentivize another post. What you're saying is Facebook has the capacity to understand our moods. Yes. Could that be used to influence our buying behaviors? Uh, of course, it can be used to influence our behavior in general, not just buying. You can be incredibly hyper-targeted. Can I give you an example? We don't always act our age or according to our gender stereotypes. A middle-aged woman might like rap music. She's sick of getting ads for gardening gloves and weight loss. So she posts on her Facebook that she likes Seth Century's Waitress song. Now she gets ads for a streaming music service, something she might actually buy. Inside of here, at the top here... Um... Adam Helfgott runs a digital marketing company in New York. He uses a tool called Facebook Pixel. Facebook gives it to advertisers to embed in their sites. They can track anybody who visits their site and target them with ads on Facebook. Well, if you've ever logged into Facebook it'll, and with, your, um, with any of your browsers, uh, it, it's a good chance it'll know, know it's you. You don't have to be logged in. You just you have to have been there at some point in time. And if it's a brand new computer and you've never logged into Facebook, um, you know, Facebook at that moment in time won't know it's you. Uh, but based upon you know, their algorithms and your usage, they'll figure it out. So what you can then do is put this piece of scripting onto your website mm -hmm. and then use Facebook data to find the people that looked at your website and then target ads to them. That's correct. Through Facebook. Yep. That feels a little bit creepy. I mean, is, is that a, are there privacy issues involved with that? I mean, from a legal point of view, there's no privacy issues. That's just, you know, the internet today um, and the state of it and using a, a product that generates a lot of revenue for Facebook. For advertisers, it is a boon, giving them access to the most intimate details of our lives. Megan Brownlow is a media strategist for PricewaterhouseCoopers in Sydney. When you change your status, for example, we might see something, a young woman changes her status to engaged. Suddenly she gets ads for bridal services. These sorts of things are clues about what her interests might really be. The research from consumers is they don't like advertising if it's not relevant to them. If it actually is something that they want, they don't mind it so much. So this is actually not a bad thing. Nick Kabrilovic is a former hacker turned security consultant. He's been using his skills to investigate the way our data is tracked. One day, Kabrilovic made a discovery that startled the tech world. He found that even if you're not logged on to Facebook, even if you're not a member, the company tracks and stores a huge amount of your browsing history, and you can't opt out. If you don't like Facebook, if you don't like the kinds of things you're describing, just close your account. It's very difficult to opt out of Facebook's reach on the web. Uh, even if you close your account, even if you log out of all your services, the way that they're set up with their sharing buttons and so forth, they're still going to build a profile for you and it's just not going to have the same level of information associated with it. They don't even tell us clearly what they're doing. They tell us some things, but it's, it's not specific enough to, to really answer the question, if somebody was going to build a dossier on me based on what Facebook knows about me, what would it look like? I should be able to know that so that I can make informed decisions about how I'm going to use the platform. Facebook is not just influencing what we buy, it's changing the world we live in. Sure, they want to kind of bring their service to everybody on the planet. Um, from a commercial standpoint, that's obviously a goal. Um, whether it makes the world a better place <laughs> is another question. Not only have you built this big business and this big social network, 
you now are determining the course of, you know, you are possibly determining the course of, of world events. That's exactly what happened in the streets of Cairo. In January 2011, millions gathered in the city demanding the resignation of the autocrat Hosni Mubarak. It became known as the Facebook Revolution. The organizers used Facebook to rally vast crowds of protesters. They were so effective that the government tried to shut down the internet. It took just 18 days to topple Mubarak. So what Facebook came to stand for several months, I would say, or at least in its early days of after the, um, the events of Tahrir Square and the Arab Spring, was a symbol of people's ability to organize and express and share information more widely. It symbolized that so much so that I like to tell stories about how I could buy T-shirts in Tahrir Square, which said, Facebook, tool of revolution. I understand as well as anybody just how effective Facebook can be. Three years ago, I was imprisoned in Egypt on trumped-up terrorism charges. My family used Facebook as a way of organizing supporters and keeping them informed. It became one of the most vital tools in the campaign that ultimately got me out of prison. The Facebook page became a place that anybody could find the latest on our case. The underlying algorithms helped push it to people who might have been interested in supporting our cause even before they knew it existed. Good to see you, How man. You? <laughs> Fantastic. Let's go inside, man. It's cold. <laughs> Mohammed Sultan was also arrested for protesting. He was imprisoned in the same jail as me. There was this medium that people just wanted to express themselves because they there was no other avenue in the public space to express themselves. And then so they found this outlet, and then they found this outlet to the outside world as well, where they they uh, would put how they feel about social justice issues on just day-to-day -day inequalities that they've seen. And then there was the second phase of that where they saw that there's quite a few of them that feel the same way about a lot of different things. It took a prolonged court case, a 500-day hunger strike, and intense international pressure to get him released. For him too, Facebook became an invaluable tool. Facebook, um, unlike other platforms and, and, uh, and social media outlets, it allowed for us to put out the reports, the medical reports, uh, allowed for us to share our, my families, to share stories, uh, and it established credibility. So Facebook provides this, in, it provides this place that is, is almost ideal for finding like-minded people, whether that means finding people who live in a certain place, who are interested in a certain thing, or people who are in the thrall of a dangerous ideology. In Australia, Facebook has also become a powerful political tool for mainstream causes and groups on the fringe. They don't want to represent you. They want to represent the great global international agenda which corrupts our people from the inside, builds mosques in our communities, floods our beautiful country with third world immigrants. But is this what we want? Blair Cottrell leads a group called the United Patriots Front a right-wing movement built on Facebook that campaigns against Muslims and immigrants across Australia. Facebook's been extremely effective for us. It's uh, indispensable to the development of our organisation. Uh, without it, uh, we would probably be a, a separatist cult where no one, would, uh, no one would be able to relate to us because no one would actually hear us directly. They would only hear about us through established media corporations. 
Islam can only pose a threat to our nation if our weak leadership, or rather complete lack of leadership, is allowed to continue. Facebook has helped turn a disparate group of individuals into a political force that some say is dangerous. It gives us the ability to cut out the middleman, to go directly to the people, to the audience, with our message, to speak directly to the Australian people, which is a power that hitherto has only been beheld by established media corporations and anybody who speaks through such media corporations. But now anybody has that power. Every, anybody has access to that power. Some of the UPF's more inflammatory statements have been censored. He's been prosecuted for staging a mock beheading that they filmed and posted on Facebook. Facebook removed some of their posts, including the original beheading video, and threatened to suspend the page. Sometimes Facebook has uh, removed or censored certain posts of ours because we've used the word Muslim, for example. Uh, not in a negative way at all. If we've explained uh, an incident or, or, a, or a point of view and we've used the word Muslim, sometimes that registers in Facebook's computer and they automatically delete it for some reason. I don't know. I don't know whether it's a person who deletes it or a computer system, but uh, that can be a bit, of a, a bit problematic sometimes. We actually started uh, altering the way we spelt Muslim in order to have our posts remain up when we were speaking about the Muslim people or the Islamic faith. Facebook has been criticised for the way it censors controversial posts. Whenever someone flags a post as offensive, it gets sent to a human moderator who decides if it should be taken down. The company says it reviews 100 million pieces of content every month. People are under a lot of pressure to l review a great deal of content very quickly. Um, and. I certainly hear about mis what appear to be mistakes uh, quite frequently, and some of them are, are are kind of ridiculous. Like at the end of uh, at the end of 2015, a whole bunch of women named ISIS had their accounts deactivated because clearly somebody went and flagged them for, as being terrorists. After an Egyptian court convicted me of terrorism charges my own Facebook page was suspended. We were never told why it disappeared. Facebook says it was to protect my privacy. We believed I'd been labelled a terrorist, violating what Zuckerberg calls its community standards. You can't have a common standard for 1.8 billion people. Our diversity is actually our strength, right? Part of what makes us a global community is the reality that what forms a global community are, are incredibly fundamental differences. In one infamous example, Facebook removed a post showing one of the most powerful images of the Vietnam War. The photograph of a naked girl violated its community standards. The community standards are developed by his staff. The community didn't develop those standards. And they're called community standards. But they were developed by Facebook. And yes, they've had input here and there over time. They also get input from governments about, you know, recently a number of governments told them, you need to amend your community standards to be harder on extremist content, you know. Uh, and so they amended their community standards. But it's not like the community got together and developed these standards. Facebook is also transforming politics as we know it. Politicians have used social media for years, of course, but in this last election, campaigners used big data to radically transform American politics. In the words of some observers, they weaponized the data. We're on our way to Washington, D.C. to find out what impact Facebook has had on the fight for political power. At the heart of political power is information. That's why government security agencies go to extraordinary lengths to vacuum up data. But increasingly, it is also becoming the key to winning power. I think that there's, you know, a legitimate argument to this that 
Facebook influenced the election, uh, the United States election results. Um, I think that Facebook and algorithms are partially responsible, if not, you know, the main reason why uh, there's this shift towards hyper-partisan uh, belief systems these days. We will soon have, by the way, a very strong and powerful border. When Donald Trump became the presidential frontrunner in last year's US election, few pundits predicted that he'd actually win. One of the Trump campaign's secret weapons was an ability to research social media data in extraordinary detail. It helped him understand and target his voters with a precision we've never seen before. By using Facebook's ad targeting engine, for example, um, they know if some of those independent voters have actually liked Republican pages or liked a Bernie Sanders page or like a Donald Trump page. So you can go to them to spend money to target advertising specifically to those voters. And it is a much more reliable, ultimately, form of targeting than many of the other online um, uh, vehicles out there. Political strategist Patrick Ruffini runs a company that mines big data for the Republican Party. He produces social media maps that help them make sure their political messages hit their targets. What it does give us is a much greater level of certainty and granularity and precision down to the individual voter, down to the individual precinct uh, about how things are going to go. It used to be we could survey 800, uh, 1,000 registered voters nationwide, but you couldn't really make projections about understanding, from that to understanding how an individual state would go or how an individual voter um, would ultimately go. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. It is one thing to know your voters, of course, and quite another to get them to change their minds. Facebook can help with that too. The ability to take the pools of big data that we've got and do really deep analysis of it to understand small groups of customers' preferences uh, can be applied in a political setting in a way that is potentially worrying because it allows politicians to potentially lie better. For instance, you can't make a political statement on television without it being disclosed who's being paid for. Those same controls on the web are very lax. For instance, I could see a story about certain XYZ politician has done a great thing produced on a completely different third-party news site. And I cannot know that that ad was placed by a political operation who have specifically targeted me because that information is not disclosed anywhere. I am understanding yet troubled by the, by the, by the data-driven advertising and targeting ads that occur, but I'm even more uncomfortable by the reality that our elections and how our elections are structured and configured can be hijacked by these forces that are not transparent to us. One of the most important parts of any democracy is news. Almost half of all Americans get theirs from Facebook. But the last US election also saw the explosion in fake news, turbocharged by sharing on Facebook. These things look like news, they function like news, they're shared like news. They don't match up with traditional ideas of what news is for and what it should do. Uh, Facebook is in the middle of this. They are, the, they are the, the company that can see all of this and make judgments about it. Um, I think they would prefer not to have to do that. Adam Schrader is a journalist who used to edit stories for Facebook's trending news section. Part of his job was to filter out fake news. Essentially, we operated like a newsroom. Um, it was structured like a newsroom. Copy editors had, you know, uh, would make sure that the topics met standards, make sure that they were unbiased, checked facts. There were oftentimes that uh, fake articles would appear and present themselves as possibly being uh, a legitimate trending topic. And our job was, you know, identifying those and um, the original term was blacklisting. 
In the heat of the campaign, right-wing commentators accused the team of bias. Facebook sacked it and handed the job to an algorithm. An algorithm cannot do the job of a, of a trained journalist. They don't have the ability to reason, right? Artificial intelligence hasn't gotten to the point where it can, you know, really function like a human brain and determine what has news value and what is good for the public and what, what is not. Schrader says after the team was sacked, fake news really took off. Yeah, after the trending news team was let go, um, there was a big problem with uh, um, uh, sensational or factually incorrect or misleading uh, news sources and uh, trending topics. It was just a disaster. The more partisan news sources you consume, the less likely you are to believe fact checkers or experts. And so this can create some really dangerous, divisive believers of alternative facts. During last year's election campaign, a news site published a story alleging that Hillary Clinton and her campaign chairman, John Podesta, were running a child sex ring out of the Comet Ping Pong Pizza restaurant in Washington, D.C. The story was widely shared on Facebook. It was utterly fake, but it gained so much traction that a 28-year-old man finally went to the restaurant armed with an assault rifle, a revolver, and a shotgun to find and rescue the children. One of the hosts runs up and is like, did you see that guy? You know, he, had a, he had a big gun. He fired several shots into the restaurant before police arrested him. The story still circulates online and on Facebook. I don't think that um, I trust the general public's ability to um, identify fake news, real news, you know, anything like that. One study found that in the closing months of the US election, Facebook users shared the top 20 fake news stories over a million times more than the top 20 stories from major news outlets. Fake stories are often written either for political advantage or to make money. There are a lot of people out there who aren't journalists and aren't publishers who are publishing. They don't have that same sense uh, of obligation. So we are really in uncharted territory. I think one of the most important things is that we actually need a big public debate about this because it's changed the nature of news and in doing so, it's changed our reality as a society. If you suspect a news story is fake, you can report it. Mark Zuckerberg initially dismissed the notion that fake news somehow skewed the election, but he is rolling out a system that allows the Facebook community to flag suspect stories. Mark Zuckerberg has said that, you know, he's not in the news publication business, right? They, it's, they're not a media company. But I think that's a, a mistake, a kind of a denial, right? So they're definitely a media company, and I think that they should try and treat themselves more as one in the future. As more and more consumers get their news from digital sources, and Facebook in particular, the old-fashioned world of newspapers and TV stations is collapsing. Like most news businesses, the New York Times is struggling. Facebook sends plenty of readers to their stories, but most advertising dollars go to Facebook. Newsrooms are shrinking along with the resources for serious journalism. You'll hear this from small publications and large ones, that their, their absolute audience is larger than it's ever been. Uh, and that surely has to mean something, but it certainly hasn't meant profits. I don't think there's a major news company in the world that, that hasn't uh, changed its operations around Facebook in a real way. And I mean that both in the, the way that it produces stories and approaches stories and the way that it makes money. If Facebook is playing an increasingly important role in how we understand the world, its social mood study showed it affects how we feel about it. When its researchers explained how they manipulated the news feeds of some 700,000 users, they were criticised for playing with people's psychology without telling them. And yet its algorithms do that every day. They give us stories they know we want to see to keep us online and help advertisers send us more ads. 
don't think we can treat Facebook as benign. I think it has enormous implications for um, how we uh, experience our lives and how we live our lives. And I think that's the, um, simultaneously, that's one of the things that makes that network and others like it so, um, uh, so phenomenally interesting and, and important. But Mark Zuckerberg's plans would have Facebook do far more. He wants its users to rely on the network for the way we organize society, discover the world, and conduct politics. He wants the community to inform Facebook, while Facebook watches over us. The philosophy of everything we do at Facebook is that our community can teach us what we need to do, and our job is to learn as quickly as we can and keep on getting better and better. And that's especially true when it comes to helping to keep people safe. For the past decade, in a post on his own profile in February, he outlined his plan for the company, a kind of manifesto for the central role he wants the platform to play in societies around the world. Uh, we're also going to focus on building the infrastructure for community, for supporting us, uh, for keeping us safe, for informing us, uh, for civic engagement, and for inclusion of everyone. So it's a document that really felt like an attempt to take some responsibility, but it wasn't apologetic. Uh, it was fairly bold, and it seemed to suggest that the solution to Facebook's problems is more Facebook. Zuckerberg has great ambition. Progress needs humanity to come together as a global community, he writes. Facebook can help build it. It wants to help fight terrorism while its news service can show us more diverse content. He is uh, behaving recently in ways more befitting of a politician than a CEO. There's a lot of speculation that he may run for office. And to my mind, uh, if Facebook continues to be as successful as it is, not just through Facebook, but through its other products, through Instagram and WhatsApp, if it continues to be so central in people's lives, he doesn't need to run for office. He will be presiding over a, a platform and a venue where people conduct a real portion of their lives. It seems there is almost no limit to Facebook's intrusion into our lives, for better or for worse. I want to thank all of you for joining us to hear more about some of the things we're working on at Facebook to help keep our community safe. Zuckerberg convened what he called the Social Good Forum to help people whose Facebook posts indicate that they might be at risk of harming themselves or committing suicide. We're starting to do more proactive work, like when we use artificial intelligence to identify things that could be bad or harmful and then flag them so our teams can review them. Or when someone shares a post that makes it seem like they might want to harm themselves, then we give them and their friends suicide prevention tools that they can share to get the help that they need. The ability to get big data and to gather data uh, about us in all aspects of our lives uh, creates a, um, a particular type of power among the people or organizations that have that data. So they can say, oh, these are your daily habits. Uh, there's been some research done that you know, nearly half of what we do is just repeating patterns of what we did the day before. Um, and from that, you can also predict, potentially, how people will behave in the near future as well. Um, and that's perhaps a little bit concerning for people who care a lot about their privacy. You use the word potential harm. That's a fairly big word. That's a fairly serious phrase. What sort of harm do you mean? So there are a couple of factors here. First is the issues that we know about already. And they are from little things such as ad targeting, giving away what your girlfriend's bought you for your birthday and doesn't want you to know about, through to a 14-year-old boy who hasn't come out as gay yet and his parents discover the fact because of the advertising that's being targeted to him, through to potential future harms. One of the problems in the privacy realm is that we only have one identity and we can't take back what we've already handed over. Facebook is far more intimately involved in our lives than any company we've ever seen before. Facebook has a responsibility to inform people of what is happening to their data. And, and so then there can be a conversation also with the community 
um, uh, about uh, whether people agree that this is an appropriate use. And, and right now they're not providing enough information for that conversation to take place. There's no take back on private data. The implications that are going to occur in five or ten years' time, we need to protect against that now. And to an extent, it almost feels like uh, I'm reminded of you know, Einstein's letter to Eisenhower warning about the potential dangers of nuclear holocaust or whatever with dangers in uranium. Not to say that it's that severe, but we're at the point now where we know that there's a danger, but we don't know the extent of it and we don't know the potential implications of it. lives are now measured in data. What we look at, who we talk to, what we do, is all recorded in digital form. In handing it to Facebook, we're making Mark Zuckerberg's company one of the most powerful in history. And the question is, at what cost to ourselves? Mm -hmm.